Welcome back to the class. This is our third lecture of the fall 2012 A. Richard Newton Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. An important announcement from the last class, it's strongly recommended that if someone has to leave the class at 6 p.m. while the lecture or Q&A is in process, please leave the class silently without making noise. Uh, getting back on our speaker series, as we talked in our first class, one of the primary objectives for this year's lecture series was to expand the breadth of our speakers beyond the tech companies and include distinguished innovators from the area of medical device, clean tech, biotech, manufacturing, crowdfunding, and other entrepreneurial focus areas. Hope you enjoyed the first two speakers, Leslie Bittorf and James Avery. If someone needs a copy of Leslie's presentation, please email me and I'll share it with you. So getting back on today's speaker, let me share the quick story and background how we finalized our today's distinguished speaker, Professor Sridhar Koda. Last year, during my coffee with Professor Koda in Washington, DC, his passion for making an impact on US manufacturing, distinct, distinctive policy insights, which I'll discuss later, and a phrase, publish and perish, instead of the legacy, publish or perish, distinctly ingrained in my memory. Has this year, in the summer, as we were planning the list of speakers with the goal of bringing distinguished innovator from all engineering fields, uh, Professor Kota's name totally stood out. Later, I'm going to introduce you as well, uh, over a chat with Dean Sastri, he not only had great words about Professor Kota, but strongly encouraged me to invite him, especially to know the perspective on advanced manufacturing. What may come as a surprise to you is that both Dean Sastri and Professor Kota have contributed significantly to President Obama's policies on advanced manufacturing. So today, we are excited to have two stalwarts among us, our current Dean of Engineering, Dean Sankar Sastri, and our distinguished guest, Professor Sridhar Kota. Please give a round of applause and welcome them. It is, it is my privilege to introduce Professor Sridhar Koda, one of United States' most distinguished manufacturing innovator and as well a policymaker. Dr. Koda is a professor of mechanical engineer at the University of Michigan in Harvard and has authored more than 200 pa papers and holds over 25 patents. He's a recipient of various ASME awards. On the entrepreneurial front, Professor Kota was the founding president and CEO of Flexus Inc., a venture engaged in bio-inspired design of aircraft wings, wind turbine blades, and automotive system. The venture has successfully executed multiple projects sponsored by NASA. One of the most important highlights in Sridhar's career is between 2009 to 2012, where he served as the assistant director for advanced manufacturing at the White House. In this role, he brought extensive product development expertise to Washington, DC, in addition to coordinating advanced manufacturing R&D, devising policy recommendations and strategies to enhance US competitiveness. One of those efforts is the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, AM, AMP, which President Obama announced at Carnegie Mellon University in 2011. Using the example from three decades, Professor Kota made the case for a strong innovation policy to strengthen our country's manufacturing base, he was able to convince the White House why the invent it here, manufacture it there, is not economically sustainable. In summary, manufacturing is absolutely es essential to innovation, and innovation cannot be decoupled with manufacturing. In summary, he played an instrumental role in launching several initiatives, including National Manufacturing Innovation Institute, National Robotics Institute, Initiative, National Digital Engineering, and Manufacturing Consortium. Today in this economy, advanced manufacturing has become more critical than ever before. Recent research has shown that each manufacturing job creates six other jobs. The multiplying factor in manufacturing is six. Even with such great need as well as opportunities in manufacturing, in this era of Zuckerberg's and especially here in Silicon Valley, we sometimes forget the real engineering and wonderful manufacturing innovation opportunities in front of us. Hence today, 
I request Sridhar to share his knowledge and insights on what Silicon Valley needs to know about advanced manufacturing. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Sridhar Koda. Sridhar, the floor is yours. Thanks, Arna. Thank you like, uh, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, uh, do I use this or I, is it on my thing? Oh, that's cool. OK. Very good. I don't know. Thanks again for inviting me. And uh, Dr. Shankar Shastri, thank you so much for your time. First of all, being here, for inviting me, and also being here. I appreciate your time uh, as well. So let me, um, before I start, you know, this is like good old teaching back in Michigan, and this is the same kind of classroom setup I have. So just uh, how many of you from MBA, uh, MBA, how many of you are MBA students, just to get an idea? OK, cool. Uh, how, about, how many of you are engineering students? Very good. And I'm sorry? We are half leaders. Oh, right, yeah, right, right. <laughs> how many from the other sciences, not engineering? OK. Cool. Now the really important question, how many of you are from Michigan? <laughs> all right, we got one there. All right, you're all great leaders, very smart people. Thank you for your time. And I'm just going to share briefly with you some of my passion and insights about advanced manufacturing. And, and of course, coming from Michigan, and you probably could expect, you know, that's what they do in Michigan, right? Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, all those guys, they just manufacture stuff. And you do all the real cool innovation stuff here. And uh, how many of you think, if you look at the uh, gross domestic product for each state, I mean, statewide, which one contributes most to manufacturing? I'd like if, do you think that California should be maybe at least in top 10 of the 50 states? No, OK. How many of you think uh, California is at least maybe top five? I know you said no, but top five of the 50. One in top five? And, and actually, it's kind of silly that I, my title is what Silicon Valley needs to know. Because if I told you California is actually number one in manufacturing, <laughs> that's combined. That's Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio combined is what, you're, what, how many, what you produce manufacturing-wise. And if you look at if the California were to be a nation, I don't know, I didn't check that yet. It's probably the, uh, maybe 10 or so, 10th nation, you know, in, in ranking nationwide in terms of the manufacturing output. So you have you know, 40,000 manufacturing establishments. And you can see the numbers actually in, two, two, you know, this is $220 billion. That is your third largest industry in, man, in California. And a lot of what you manufacture is on the computers um, and semiconductors. And chemicals and others you can read. I'm not sure how many of you can read there. But the point is that you, know, you do a lot of manufacturing uh, and uh, in an area that's actually a very important sector. I mean, they're all important. But the point I say important because, again, it's one of those areas where we actually have big trade deficits too. So you got to up your game on that. And <laughs> so, but but this, is, this is interesting. And of course, you, know, you, you, you exported $44 billion worth of manufactured goods last year. And that's a significant portion of your, 87% of your exports are manufactured goods. So you already know a lot about manufacturing. It's not that I need to come and talk about it. But the thing is, there are some great challenges and some great opportunities for smart folks like you to get involved and, and uh, do, do some real things. When you talk about innovation, which is, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. I'll save some time for questions, because I really want to hear from you. And I innovation, as you know, you know in, in the whole product development uh, value chain. If you look at it, you start with the discovery, scientific discovery. Then you have when well, some of those discoveries could turn into engineering inventions. That's just still an idea and a patent. And then, of course, the innovation is actually taking that promising idea into translating into a convert into a marketable product at scale, a product or a process or a method. Right? That's a real innovation. That's what the definition of innovation is: converting a promising idea into a practical idea. Then, of course, once you have that in my world of manufacturing, then you go into pre-production and manufacturing. Or if it's some software, it could be something else. So with that definition, actually, there is a, that is a real definition. But we throw the word around innovation to mean lots of different things. It always, sometimes it means discovery. Sometimes it means invention. But it's important to understand that because, again, if you look at the most recent uh, definition, a broader definition by national academies. We can discuss it, why this is so broad definition, why they're given a broad definition. We'll get to that part later. But innovation means the first to acquire knowledge and first to apply that knowledge uh, and, and then to create sought-after products and services 
often through world-class engineering, because that's what the science is not going to create wealth by itself. You've got to do something with that knowledge, and that's what the engineers do uh, in converting that pro their ideas into products, everything that you look around. And of course, the first to introduce those products and services into marketplace. And I think if we look at the last 20, 30 years, uh, there are not many technological innovations that originated here and are still being manufactured today. I say tech because right away people say, well, what about my iPhone? Well, iPhone is a great business innovation. The technology behind the iPhone has been around before the iPhone was around. So I mean the technological innovations wise, you know, we've been coming up with ideas, but a lot of things are made overseas. And why is that a big deal? We'll talk about that. So I think we've been falling behind in the middle. The missing middle is application of that knowledge. And we've, you know, we've lost a number of industries. You know, the idea that, is, as uh, uh, Arno pointed out, invent here, manufacture, that is really not economically sustainable. So we lost a whole bunch of industries, you know, semiconductors, lighting, electronic displays, and so on and so forth. So the, the thing that most economists don't get is that they somehow think it's, you know, innovation is different and manufacturing is different. We do innovation and let those guys do manufacturing. I'm not talking about manufacturing of you know, t-shirts and shoes. You know, I'm talking about advanced technology products where there's a strong correlation between innovation and manufacturing. So if you look at this chart, what I'm showing here, you know, the government itself, your taxpayer, your dollars, we invest about $140 billion of it, if you take the defense side out, about $70 billion non-defense into basic research to come up with ideas and, and, and cool discoveries. Now, only a small fraction of those discoveries or engineering inventions turn into real products. So then, of course, then, uh, then of course you create, you know, you develop the product, you do, you know, proof of concept prototypes, and you do the hard work. That's that 99% perspiration. What it takes, right? You had the one person inspiration. You got to do the 99% perspiration to convert that idea into a real product or a process, whatever it might be. So the real inventions, the real innovations actually come about in product and process innovations when you try to do that and when you actually scale the, scale the idea to make the product to be cost effective, safe, and reliable, and, and all that other stuff before you can sell it. So that what leads to, and then that feeds back into the next generation of you know, innovation. So if you just keep going, and then what happens at the end of the day, at the end of the, at the, end of the year, we, you know, you put $70 billion in, you get minus $100 billion out. Then you put another 70 in, you get minus 100 out, you keep repeating it, you're not, you're not gonna get a different result. Even if you double the 70 to 140. So the point is, if you, no matter how good you are, like, you know, like the what I have is like a baseball diamond thing, no matter how good you are at going to the first base, you don't score a run until you go around. And there's no easy home run here. So, and then that is clearly shown here on the right hand side, the chart you're looking at, for those of you back there, can so you can see the green and the red. You're looking at the years across, you know, how from you know, through 2010, we always had surplus in advanced technology products. This, this, you know, biotech, medical, advanced technology products is a category that has a definition like you know the semiconductors and computers and precision machinery, medical equipment, and so on, and and biotechnology. This is where these are the kinds of things you expect uh, to come out of our investments in research and development. So instead, we have, we have negative balance there, as I talked about it. That's what we always had surplus that turned into, into deficit in 2001. And last year, we had $100 billion deficit. So that's what I was talking about. And here, if you look at, you know, again, how many of you can read from there, I'm not sure. But what you're looking at the going, this is taken from Pisano's article that says the ship is going, 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 gone. It's listing all these different technologies from semiconductors and lighting and electronic displays, energy storage. Uh, computing and communications and advanced materials are listed in each category. It lists, you know, things that we already lost and the ones that circled are at risk that we're going to be losing are at risk of losing those technologies. Most of the, mo all of the technologies listed here were largely invented here. <clears throat> they're largely invented in this country, but none of them are made here. So the point is if we don't make the today's advanced technology product, you lose your ability to innovate next generation product. Uh, so that, that, is, that is the challenge. And here is just one example. We all, we all know nanotechnology, all the cool things can come out of it. You know, federal government invested, you know, I don't know, right now about 12 or $14 billion to date. And what the chart you're looking at, I'm taking from Lux Research uh, report, 
again, on the y-axis, it shows the nanotechnology activity. The main body of the chart, all the circles, are represent different countries. So you have the nanotechnology activity on the y-axis and the technology development strength on the x-axis. So obviously, you want to be on the right-hand side of the chart, so you're converting ideas into products. So if you look at the, the top half, where there's a lot of activity, you can see where the United States is. You know, it's off the charts almost. It's way up on the top on our activity. But if you look at the countries on the right-hand side, the dominant quadrant, you have obviously the usual suspects, Germany, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And, uh, and you can see how they have much stronger tech, they have a stronger you know, technology development process in place than we do. And for each of those charts, each of those dots, actually there are three dots, for, you know, it shows the trends from 2007, eight, and nine, which way the country is tending. Well, obviously, for those of you who can't see, I want to point out that the US is going in the other direction. We are in the ivory tower category, and we are going in the other direction. So that's what I mean by it's not enough to just to be coming up with ideas, but we got to convert them into products as a nation. So if we don't do that, you know, in the past, um, well, I'll come to that okay, here. So if we, the, yes? Oh, my, all right. Oh, I'm sorry. Cool, thank you. All right, Malros that now. So here, uh, you know, the, the why can't we make Amazon Kindle here? The point is, a lot of the components that go into Amazon Kindle, you know, from the injection molded case to the hard drive to the display and the flux circuit and the battery, all the supply chains for all these components <coughs> are already in Asia. In fact, we had an opportunity with the Massachusetts-based E-Ink Corporation, some of you may know, that actually revolutionized you know, that what enabled Amazon to make Kindle, that key technology. And, but the point is the rest of the supply chains are there. They couldn't make it here in this country at all. So they sold it to uh, PrimeView, and they ended up actually moving the company to Taiwan and because everybody else is there. So this is sad in terms of it's not only, this is an example of how it's not enough to be, once you lose your supply chains and you won't be able to scale, and the point is, if you, if you won't be able to manufacture, so the next generation Kindle, where do you think the chances are it's going to be the invented or the next generation uh, e-reader? Probably it's more likely to be there, more and more likely to be over there rather than here. That's how you lose the base. The other point I want to make is that, you know, if the Kindle is not made in this country, you know, none of us probably care. It's probably less expensive made in Taiwan anyway. But imagine if that Kindle were to be a, a defense critical product. You don't want to be relying on somebody else because you can't make the defense critical product in this country, and there are a lot of challenges involved in that. So there's another reason, too. It's not only economic security. It's a national security issue as well that we manufacture stuff here. And the R&D and manufacturing, especially in advanced technology products, are strongly coupled. Um, and you can see that there is, you know, the R&D in intensive industries means those industries where the R&D or sales ratio is greater than 3%. And you can see how we are slipping already. Our R&D intensity is behind Germany, Korea, and Japan. On one hand, you know, we are certainly losing in our advanced technology products. We are having trade deficits. But our R&D intensive products, which are also advanced technology products, we are falling behind as well. No, there's no question we're not going to make shoes and t-shirts. But we, once we lose the advanced technology products, I don't know what our competitive advantage is going to be. Because our competitive advantage has to be you know, high productivity, high skilled workers, and high tech stuff. So, um, the one thing I want to point out is that the federal government invests, you know, seventy hundred billion dollars a year on basic research. And when people show the total U.S. R and D, they combine the federal part and the. I don't have a whole bunch of other charts. I don't want to bore you with it. But there's a federal investment and then the corporate investment. For large multinational corporations today, you know, the, the R&D is mostly D. They are more interested in how to make the today's product better, faster, cheaper, lighter. They're not so much interested in your cool idea with your synthetic biology or nanotechnology and how it's going to change the next generation lighting or what have you. They are too busy figuring out whether to go to Vietnam or China right now, making the product faster and cheaper. 
So their development is the current product. They certainly have a technology innovation part, which is incremental innovation, because that's the only way. They have the infrastructure invested in how to make the current product. They're not, there's a reason why they can't keep changing over and come up with a whole new way of making stuff. So their innovations are all incremental in nature, understandably so, and that's how they stay, remain competitive. But the radical innovations that come with the cool ideas of smart people like you at the universities require you know, carrying that cool idea and then taking it to the, into maturing the technology and its manufacturing readiness. And nobody's doing that. That's where we have a major gap. So we got to put the D back in R&D. And given that, there's a major disconnect between federal R and industrial D. See, back when we had Bell Labs and Menlo Park, they used to do these things, some of them. They used to do some of this. So they had the patient capital to invest in cool ideas to bring to the market to the next generation products. That has not, that's been gone. And of course, when the manufacturing goes, as you know, the engineering goes, then the R&D started moving too. There are a number of examples from Intel to applied materials uh, establishing more and more R&D overseas. In fact, in the last few years, the, the corporate America has invested three times as much in R&D overseas than they have in this country. So to me, that's scarier than some of the other things in terms of not being able to manufacture Kindle. <laughs> now, again, you might think, you know, I can talk all day long and talk about all these problems, but you know, if we got Chinese making, you know, one-tenth of what we make here on hourly wage, how the heck are we going to compete? You know, this is all R&D and all this stuff isn't make, it's, it's not, you know. But the point is it's nothing to do with the labor cost, especially the advanced manufacturing high-tech products. Look at what Germany is doing. Germany has 30 to 40 percent higher wages than the United States. They're, that's not a low-wage country. That's more expensive there than here. So they have more, their wages are 30 to 40 percent higher. And of course, they have a strong manufacturing base, even through this whole economic downturn worldwide. And they have a positive balance in manufacturing advanced technology products. They are competing with the same China we are competing with, right? In all the other things, you know, the bad policies and bad trade, free trade, unfair trade, whatever it might be, they are competing with the same, same country. And yet they have a positive balance and they show that, you know, and then we invest six times as much as China does in R&D. I'm sorry, six times as much as Germany does in R&D. But there's one particular category in that whole investment where they spend six times as much as we do in, in, in called industrial and production technology. That is the 99% the inspiration part, um, perspiration part taking an idea from smart guys like you, and then putting hard work in you know, maturing the idea, developing, testing, validating, back and forth, going in circles until they get the product that is acceptable to the customer. And then that's when, when it, they de-risk it, then of course the private sector would be happy to invest and scale it. That's the difference. So just in 2008, we had a $200, $800 billion deficit, and they had $200 billion surplus. And that's a trillion dollars difference between this Germany and US. And their taxes are slightly lower than ours, compared to you know, the standard statutory car, marginal tax rate-wise, they're less than ours. Uh, but we'll talk about how many of these big companies make, really pay the, the marginal tax rate. But if you look at the, uh, so the pollution, Abatement costs, the energy costs, structural costs, they're all same or higher in Germany than here. So that's something to keep in mind when you think about China, how do we compete? Think about Germany, how they're competing. And the reason is, if, for, you know, there is a, if you look at what we do at universities and federal labs, the really, really interesting and radical new innovations, inventions, not innovations, uh, and then, you know, unless you de-risk that idea, the private investors, VCs, they don't put money in, as you know very well. So they have, in other countries, they have institutions in place that actually do the de-risking. The Fraunhofer Institutes in Germany, some of you probably heard of them, right? And they, they are, their institutes, they are they, uh, focused on applied research. And whereas in, in same thing copied wonderfully well in Taiwan, the uh, ITRI, and, and uh, you know, they, are, they have, uh, the Korea has similar models. So the point is we need institutions like that. So with that, let me just uh, briefly explain just a few things about 
okay, what do we do about it? I mean, so much about admiring the problem, right? Now, what, what kind of things we could possibly do? I'll share with you a few things that we have done in, the, in what the Washington DC has done in the recent years, and there's a lot, long ways to go. First is to establish a robust manufacturing base, I say, because robust, I say, because we can be you know, sensitive to, oh, the, today the transportation costs are high, fuel costs are high, so we have advantage. Or they are cheating on their monetary policies, so we have disadvantage. When they change their monetary, Okay, those are all real, I understand, but we gotta have a really robust manufacturing base that can withstand all these fluctuations in you know, monetary policies and, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the currency manipulation I meant, and, and also the uh, uh, transportation costs or whatever. So, why we wanna do that is of course for the economic and national security reasons, and if we just, and I already talked about how we have trade <coughs> deficit, we gotta turn it into trade surplus. I just wanna give you one of the uh, uh, statements made in public more recently about how we have a million electronic parts in the counterfeit parts in our military equipment, which is what I was talking about. They can't be made here, they are made overseas, they are counterfeit parts, that is pretty dangerous. You can do a lot of damage. So that's an issue on the national security side. So I, I put two categories, I call it innovation, that is to create new industries, and the other one is to enhance competitiveness of existing industries. So there's a whole host of issues that we need to address. Technology is just one of them. You know, the access to skilled workforce, the taxes and the free trade and fair trade and, and regulations and all of those come into picture and access to markets and what have you. But the point I want to emphasize is, again, the missing middle of our innovation gap in our pipeline. <clears throat> So let me just quickly hit up on the, some, of the, some of the new initiatives that may give you some ideas about the opportunities. Um, so one is closing the innovation gap. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Arnav, I have a, what, what time do I stop? In five, 10 minutes? No, you have 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. 10. Mm. I'll try to have time for your questions. Closing the innovation gap, Again, just like in our response to Fraunhofer Institutes in Germany, the president has announced a billion dollar investment next year into creating manufacturing innovation institutes. And where the, well, our role is to imply, apply, you know, in, invest in applied research in, in broadly applicable technology. It's not like industrial policy, picking winners and losers stuff. We can talk about that if you have questions, but this is about innovation policy where you're investing in broadly applicable technologies you know, sharing it private private companies, public as a public private partnerships, and a number of other things in terms of the decreasing, you know, the, the whole supply chain issues and you know, creating shared facilities for especially for small and medium sized manufacturers to enhance their competitiveness. You know, we have like three hundred thousand small and medium sized manufacturers, and I will. In the interest of time, if you have questions, I'll, the one thing I want to say on this slide is that, you know, we, we still, in spite of the budget cuts and the tough economic times, there's plenty of money to go around in that if we can only invest in a way that is coordinated and strategic investment or, or taxpayers' dollars, we can do a, make the whole greater than some of its parts. And things like if you take, you know, let's make a fuel efficient uh, connected vehicles, you know, connected vehicles could be, you know, you know, IT and transportation, that's a huge opportunity there, lightweight, fuel efficient vehicles, it's not only good for the economy, for the fuel prices, but also, it also helps the Department of Defense in saving the soldiers' lives. So the point I wanna make is that there are a lot of issues that actually, the national security, energy security, and economic security overlap. And you know, we could actually have a more coordinated investment and get the most for our taxpayer dollar. And there are initiatives like you know, promoting lab to market commercialization. The president has issued a memo in, in, in October last year asking various federal agencies, the agencies who are spending tens of billions of dollars every year, to have a plan to, have, to intensify their efforts in trans transitioning the technologies from lab to marketplace. And there are a number of things that were put in place, like the patent, you know, not only the patent reform issue, but also making it easier for companies, startups, to engage with uh, federal labs that have intellectual property, and there are a whole bunch of issues like that. So that's one. And the Department of Commerce has put these I-6 green challenges, that is to establish proof of concept centers. So you have a great idea for, you know, on a particular high growth technology area, they provide money to establish a proof of concept centers, which is much needed for startups and, and to actually create uh, value. Um, 
let me uh, start up America, because I know you guys are all entrepreneurs and smart kids with, with great ideas. Here with uh, the Startup America, you probably heard of that. I'm sure there's Startup California before anything else. This is an investment by, the, by call to action by the president to promote entrepreneurship and in, in, in innovation, and primarily to ex expand access to capital for high growth startups. I mean, there's a $2 billion set aside by SBA, Small Business Administration. A billion dollars goes into, if you can find a private sector to invest uh, X dollars, the government will match X dollars. But if you happen to be doing this in a, in a distressed zone, you know, like in some of the areas of the country, then you actually get twice as much. If you get it for every dollar you put in, the government puts $2 towards the, uh, you know, match the venture capital funding. And there are other uh, programs for startups for promoting you know, from startup to scale up. So depend, depending on wherever you are, whether you're at the idea stage, startup, ramp up, or speed up, there are various programs put in place, uh, not only the $2 billion from, you, from, from the government, but also there are a number of companies uh, that put in, like Intel, uh, HP, Microsoft. They put $100, $150, $200 billion, million dollars into into the thing, in, in, into this whole Startup America uh, program to promote entrepreneurship. So there are some great opportunities and some access to capital. Through data.gov communities, this is again a quick point is that, you know, government has a lot of data that's sitting there, but the idea is that if you release it, give it to public, smart kids like you, smart, smart folks will find a way to make use of it and convert that into business uh, idea. So, for example, the weather is a good example, right? There's a lot, of government has all the weather data in the world. By putting it out, you know, you got, you know, someone like you created an iPhone app for, uh, for weather and, and all the other stuff. So, likewise, there are a lot of things out there. If you have any interest in health sector, I encourage you to look at health.data.gov. If you just go to that site, it's got a lot of cool challenges and a lot of data. There are things like, you know, um, I don't have the time to go into details, but a lot of cool uh, entrepreneurial ideas and apps came out of this health.data.gov. And there, you may look at it and think of many more. Uh, there's another one called energy.data.gov. And more recently, we launched, um, earlier part of this year, the manufacturing.data.gov to show not only where the federal funding opportunities are in manufacturing, but also what kind of federal assets there are, what kind of shared facilities that you could use, and what kind of IP is available from, from uh, um, our federal labs uh, to help you build your business. So that's a one-stop shop. And another important point is that we have a lot of open source software. You know, the government labs spend hundreds of millions of dollars on all sorts of research every year. There's a lot of cool software, open source software that's sitting there. And for example, NASA released 25 of their codes. And you guys could be you know, looking at that data, looking at that free open source software, and creating a really really cool app. And I can tell you examples of people who are doing like at Purdue, for example, more recently, uh, creating a, a very general purpose program that can do modeling of solids and liquids and, and fluids. And that is actually used to model the pump lubrication modeling to reduce, the, you know, optimize the pump design, which you could not have done any other way. Um, and that will actually improve the pump performance. That the pump industry is like sort of, I don't know, $10, $20 billion industry. So this is a simple app you can create. And also, there are opportunities in manufacturing. There are like 300,000 small and medium-sized manufacturers who could be, who are not ready to buy you know, $100,000 software and hire a $100,000 person to run it. But if you can create software tools um, for design, development, testing, that could be easy to use. It could be cloud-based or it could be running on your iPad. And something that you can simplify, you don't need to have a PhD in physics to run this software, but if you could just tell this, co you know, this uh, company, the small company just makes these this widgets. Don't need to know all about the, uh, the mold flow for all these complex viscoelastic fluids and all that stuff. You just want to know how the heck to make it, how to make it so there's no seam here, how to make different size pens. So if you can create an application-specific template there are a lot of opportunities uh, with the software that's out there, with the need that's out there for small and medium-sized manufacturers, which is not, it is unfilled right now, and unmet, I meant. If you go to challenge.gov, just remember that, there are, you know, the, the, again, this is another initiative where for promote entrepreneurship, the, the government has put these challenges online. 
and encouraging, you know, increasingly full of participants. Just to give one example, there are like 150 challenges, and actually inspired by X Prize originally. Because the nice thing about challenge is that for the government or anybody, you only pay for results, right? You don't, you don't, you establish a goal without choosing a particular approach, and people come up with a different ways of solving it. One example, NASA has been struggling with, for example, how to predict the harmful radiation from the sun um, so that they can protect their satellites and, and, and humans in space, and there is, it's a complicated process in terms of predicting it correctly. And they've been working on it for years, and I don't know how many millions they spent. They put that challenge out here. Uh, this guy is a retired, semi-retired radio engineer from New Hampshire saw that challenge and solved it for a $40,000 prize they're implementing it, which is like, who would have thought of that? So there are a lot of cool challenges out there for, again, entrepreneurial ideas. And, and, and here is another example of how, you know, the Department of Defense would have these big fat cat uh, contractors come up with a new vehicle design, maybe three or four or five of them, right? They took up on a, uh, they thought, you know, well, let's open it up to public. They worked with local motors in Arizona and then said, we need a design for this uh, combat vehicle. And this guy sitting in that corner over there, this Victor Garcia, an immigrant uh, living in Southern California, in some doing some lowly clerical work, but always had passion for design. So he thought, he saw this challenge. His design won. There were 159 valid entries came. Rather than usually they have five to choose from, De Defense had 159 to choose from, and his design was the best. And they took three months to convert that into a product and in into a vehicle and drove it up to uh, Washington, D.C., to, to Pittsburgh for an event uh, and delivered it to the to president. So this is another example, again. There are, you know, Defense buys, you know, they spent 200 Billion, over $200 billion every year buying manufactured goods. More than anyone else in the world, right? $200 billion, more than that. And they reach to like 30,000 small and medium-sized manufacturers. When we have 300,000 medium and manufacturers, they reach to only one-tenth of the potential uh, participants. That's because they're you got to dig, everything goes through FedBiz Ops. That, I don't know if anybody knows, that's the lamest website you can think of. And nobody wants to go there. So we open it up, just like the Alibaba.com, and how do we get more of these suppliers engaged and make it competitive? And again, there's a lot of opportunity as well. And boy, I'm running out of time. And one last, one, one, a couple of, sorry? Are you guys talking about that? Okay. All right. So here's the, here's the thing. I talked about, you know, we launched this manufacturing hub. You know, we wanted to do a little experiment. The small manufacturers, you know, like many, all of you now, even all our friends from, even though you're not in engineering, you know that too, smart guys. The modeling and simulation tools, you know, you can design your product, you can test it, you can engineer it, you can optimize it, and you can even figure out how it's gonna be made. You can do all the simulation, you can do everything on the computer, right? Before you make anything. That's been around for 30 years, and all the companies do it all the time, all the big companies. But that software tools, which can reduce the product development time, improve the quality, and reduce costs, very well proven tools, most little, 85% of our small, comp, small and medium sized manufacturers, right? They don't use them because it's too expensive, it's too complicated. So we unleashed this idea of putting it on the cloud and made pay as you go business model. And work with, if you go to manufacturinghub.org, you will see that here is a 25% company. They were able to use these tools because of this program, and where PNG and John Deere and Lockheed and Caterpillar and Boeing, not Caterpillar, but Boeing and GE participated with their supply chain. This 25% company, there are a lot of success stories, I'm just telling you one. They would have never imagined to have bid on a contract like that for with Volkswagen, a huge plastic pallet they need to be made. And they, got, they were able to demonstrate how they can design, build, and do this on the computer. And they won the contract because of this capability. Today, they are making and exporting that product. A year ago, this is uh, September now, let's say, yeah, a year ago, that used to be made in, made in China. So there is plenty of opportunity for creating apps I already talked about. So I'm going to move on. And another important thing is, you know, 
I don't see many, you know, there are a lot of, you know, you're all smart engineering kids or business kids and, and others. But if you think about all your friends in high school and middle school, you know, what made you, I don't have time to have, I would rather talk to you and get your feedback. Why did you decide to go into engineering or sciences? It's somewhere in the middle school you make the decision, right? And we, we need to inspire kids about engineering, not as something that, oh, unless you're, a, you know, you're, you're really good in math, otherwise don't even think of engineering. That's actually such a geeky way to put it. That's why people get turned off. Not a lot of smart kids don't rush to engineering schools. If we could only inspire them that, what, you know, every, look around you, everything is made by engineers, right? Designed and made by engineers. So if we can, if we can tell them about what the, you know, the, the creative aspect of engineering, the innovation aspect of engineering, the entrepreneurship aspect of engineering, you could be Steve Jobs and you could be a lot of others in terms of coming up with cool ideas and making products. That's why we need to rebrand engineering and get kids excited about engineering. And, the, and again, there are a number of examples like this. There are some great programs like First Robotics and Project Lead the Way. If you've participated, you know. Um, and also, if you think about, again, I give a German example. This company is still Siemens. Siemens spends $220 million a year providing 10,000 apprenticeships in Germany. Not that they're going to hire all 10,000 people. If they don't hire, their suppliers will hire. It will build the in infrastructure, right? The knowledge and the skills. We've got to be doing stuff like that here. Like the same thing with the steel company in, in Virginia. These summer camps is what gets kids excited about. I'm sure you guys who are in engineering probably had ideas, you know, somehow what inspired you. And those who are not in engineering probably could relate to how you thought, wow, you've got to be really a you know, mathematical genius, otherwise you don't need to do engineering. That's unfortunate. And, and two more slides. I think the other main point I want to make in the lack of, since I don't have time here, is when you, the whole idea of engineering, I'm not talking about this because I'm an engineering geek, because I think engineering is so important. No, you look at the numbers I showed you, right? We are still the best country in the world when it comes to ideas and science. We have the best science in the world. But somehow that's not trickling down to our economic benefit or energy security or national security. So it's not like I'm a geek, that's why I wouldn't think engineering is important. Don't you see the connection between you know, converting an idea, promising idea into practical idea, that's what engineers do? That's, that's because we, scientists are doing great science. Unfortunately, many engineers are doing pseudoscience. They're not doing engineering because they're so much wrapped up in writing papers. Because for, in science, for example, if your dissemination is the, is the currency, right? You discover water on Mars, you want to tell everybody like right now. You don't even want to wait till this lecture is done. You want to tweet everybody. But if you really had a better recipe for some cool thing, you really want to tell everybody right now? Or you want to protect the idea, develop the idea, mature it, make sure there's a business case for it? So the fact that you're so busy writing papers tells me that maybe what you're writing about is not that valuable. It's because you're in engineering. So. Something we need to think about, what, what does it really matter? What are the real metrics? And you know, rather than publish or perish, which is what the scientists do, I think as engineers, we should be doing better than publish and perishing. We should do beyond publish. So um, the last slide, hopefully we'll have some time for questions, is to summary. I think what I want to say is the government needs to be doing more coordinated investment and strategic investment, leveraging not just the money they're spending every day, but also leveraging the early procurement by, government, by defense. If you think about it, you know, the, Boeing didn't start the day after, you know, Wright Brothers flew in Kitty Hawk. It's, it's the, the NASA was created. You know, they created these wind tunnels to understand the airfoils and everything. And in fact, the war effort in World War I you know, the first 15 years after Wright Brothers Floyd, we probably, we made like less than 500, 500 cars, 500 airplanes in this country. When you got the World War I, we made, you know, 12,000 aircraft and 14,000 engines within a span of 18 months. So the government procurement can accelerate innovation, whether it's in aircraft or semiconductors, computers or internet or GPS and ev most everything else. There is a role that government can play if you can 
have a strategic investment. And if you have ideas for that, that's another opportunity to see if government can be the first adapter. Okay? And of course, all said and done, you know, we can still do our engineering and mature the technology and manufacturing readiness. After that, if you take it to some other country, that still didn't solve any problem because that's actually worse than we are now, right? So we need to find a way to anchor manufacturing here, and I don't have time to get into the details of how we could potentially do that, but that's important. And of course, I think the private sector has a strong role to play, an important role to play in building the innovation ecosystem in things like you know, sponsoring summer camps and creating paid internships and, and you know, getting kids excited about manufacturing and engineering and entrepreneurship in the high schools and middle schools. And universities, actually, uh, Dr. Shastri, I got to mention that, you know, when I had talked somewhere else, I actually give your example of the things, actually, I have a slide, I, don't, I can show it to you later, about the Berkeley example of the, the visionary example here about how, what is valued here in terms of the, not just the theory, but, you know, the, the technology trans, transition and commercialization. And, and uh, so that's important. Since I'm here, I don't need to talk about it, but uh, anyhow. This will hopefully leave a few minutes for questions. I will have time. I'll stop here. Why don't we take a couple of questions, and after that, all the people who ask questions then can come front. We can have a chat session with Professor Koda. Yes, sir. What's your take as far as governmental funding to advance technologies in the United States versus private, private funding? Because you right. talk a lot about the government and the funders. But my personal take is that it's very inefficient for the government to do that. Right, right. You know, if, if you can find a private, the question is, what's that, what's that you know, the, what my take on government funding technologies versus private sector funding technologies? The private sector, if we can get private sector to fund it, we don't need the government to fund it. That's total waste. But there are a lot of technologies. The reason the, the emerging technologies, which have broad applications, the private sector doesn't fund, because no one company or no one industry can reap all the benefits. That's called market failures, right? So where the societal benefit is much more than the company return on investment. So that's why. There's a role for government to come in and mature the technology and de-risk it. Once they de-risk it, then of course the private sector actors will come in and because in the end it's a private sector that creates jobs, it's a private sector that manufactures stuff. Government doesn't make anything. But they don't have the patient capital to mature a technology, especially if your competitor is going to benefit from your, from your inventions, right? That's where, that's where there is a real role for government and for public-private partnerships. That's what the, the new Manufacturing Innovation Institute's idea is about. Because the government has a role in funding basic research, but when it comes to applied research, you know, we want private sector to also have a skin in the game. So part, I don't know if I answered that question. Fair enough? Yeah. So here, here is how, um, here, here is a theory. I mean, in practice, I don't know how it's going to happen. Is the government will say, if you have a technology, there could be an open solicitation, they're not picking a particular technology or the other, right? Here is a solicitation that comes out saying that, you know, we'll put, you know, 50 to $70 million if you come up with a technology that has high growth potential both in employment and output. Whatever the technology is, right? If it's not in the next 50 years, you know, in the next five years. High growth potential. And where you demonstrate there are market failures, that there's no private actor coming to fund it, right? 
because this is something, this, this technology, if you invest in roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing of flexible electronics, it will help flexible displays, it will help solid state lighting, it will help thin film batteries, it will help a few other things. So they're all different industries, you see. So if you demonstrate that this is a broadly applicable technology, and there's a market failure here that the government, okay, that's the criteria. The other one is, if government still has, if the US still has an opportunity to we have the first more advantage. What I mean is if the ship has already left, no point in chasing that, that's gone. And if you have industry willing to not just participate, but co-invest, right? That's when you can, you'll really know whether this is for real or this is just some academic exercise. So if you do that, the government will put 50% and you put industry put 50%, you put a consortium together where you have university and government industry work together, universities and industry, both small and large companies. Small companies are the ones who are the startups and small ones are the innovative ones, but we still need the large ones because in the end, they are the ones who have the capability to scale up, right? And you have created this shared facility and you could actually help a whole bunch of companies and startups and small businesses using the shared facility that can itself could create. So that's how, this is the framework on how we're gonna set it up and we can, the idea is to set up about 15 such institutes. Yeah. There's another question. Bouncing back on that. Yeah. What's your personal opinion as far as, I see in the US there's a very large limiting factor, and that's labor and the high cost of labor. And for anyone that does manufacturing right now, the thought is where can I go to have my product manufactured cheaper? I know where I just came from working for, we deal, are dealing with that. We're looking at moving our operations overseas. Everyone's looking at doing that. So what is your take on that? How can you overcome that? And what kind of company? I mean, you don't need to tell me the name of the company, but what kind of product is that? Uh, Small size or a big size? Big or? size, and they uh, provide to like the Department of Defense. Okay. Some Before I answer the real question, the Department of Defense get a great customer, but also you don't have the volume, because when that's not going to be enough to sustain in the real world, so you need to find the, the commercial counterparty, but that's the, anyway. Oh, oh, one of the customers, sorry. So on that note, again, that is why I give the Germany example. Somehow Germany's doing it. Somehow Japan's doing it. They're, you know, Germany pays 30 to 40% higher wages than us. I know Sweden does too. But you know, Sweden's got a smaller economy than Germany's economy. So it's not the labor, but if you think about, you know, I have a chart, I don't have time to show it, but uh, you can email me, I'll email it to you. Uh, the, if you look at the, all the things that you would consider, suppose you're gonna sit down and figure out what are the costs involved in going overseas, not just the labor, but the, all the other overhead you gotta think about, the transportation costs, the logistics, and the patents, and the third party, and, and the list goes on, right? It's amazing, 60% of the companies who actually ran to China or other, elsewhere, rushed outsourcing, did not consider most of the costs, and I wonder, you know, this is all do fully documented. So if you look at the total cost, depending on the size of the product, right? You know, there's a shipping issues, there's an inventory issues, you get stuck with the, you know, the inventory two weeks or three weeks uh, 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 transition from, from Asia. And you have, depending on the nature of the product, if it requires quick design changes and working with the manufacturer and the designers, and then, then you don't get that, uh, that just-in-time changes and just-in-time manufacturing. So there are a lot of downsides to it before rushing over there. So it's not just the labor, right? So again, if it's an advanced technology product, you want to be close to where, those, where the technology innovators are. So you're continuously improving and going to the next stage. If it's making shoes, uh, maybe making shoes is pretty complex too, I don't know, I apologize, but, but maybe it's not. So uh, Dean Sastri had a really interesting idea. As you might have looked in the presentation, that Purdue came up with a really cool app for the model, fluid model, as well as the product design. I was wondering, would you guys be interested in it? And we can throw up a challenge. If Purdue can come with it, I'm sure we can come with it as well. Oh, yeah. I, I you guys are. I'd go to that grand challenge website. Challenge.gov. Challenge.gov. Uh, this I'll send everyone the link about kids. it. Probably we can do an, a hacking event out at the Skydeck Incubation Center. Sridhar was out there. Yeah. And we can do it. 
So once again, I would like to thank Sridhar for his insightful talk. And thank you, students.